So what's better, actual GH or peptides? So specifically, GHRPs, GHRHs. So realistically, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. It depends on your risk profile. And it also depends on the access you have to these drugs. I'll say personally, I prefer GH, yet it is something that is very difficult to come by in terms of getting a prescription for it. With GHRPs, tesamorel and ipamorelin, they can work, but they are less consistent. And realistically, when we're looking at the price, I've seen some wild quotes from individuals just paying into the thousands to get these GHRPs and not really being told what they do, not really being supported in terms of dietary education, and realistically understanding the back end of this. This is where a lot of clinics, a lot of companies make money. And before I move on, I just want to touch on that because I know I went into MK677. This is going to mimic ghrelin, and that's not a free lunch. And quite literally, appetite will increase. So this is one that I've literally seen clients come to me who are put on it alongside ipamorelin, alongside semaglutide. And when I ask them just based on these, I'm like, what are your goals here? Like, why was this prescribed? What was the indication? And they're like, I want to lose fat and I'm having a hard time. That's kind of why I'm reaching out for some assistance for something a little more hands-on. And realistically seeing that For me, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth because, I mean, you quite literally have compounds that are competing with one another and doing quite the opposite of uh, mechanism of action. But realistically, then you have a client who is now struggling with achieving their goals, i.e. fat loss, on account of them not being able to be inherent because they have this ghrelin agonist in place. And sure, it's like, okay, well, can't they just cancel each other out? Yeah, but... I would rather take an approach where an individual isn't paying two, three, four thousand dollars every couple months to have these things in place that aren't really getting them the results that they're looking for. All right, next question. What should my IGF-1 levels be at on GH? So what you're going to find is that from very educated individuals in the space who are very plugged in to like the sport of bodybuilding, you'll hear them quote levels. 350, 450, maybe even 500. Now, realistically, I would say that it's probably a little reckless to chase. And if we're just looking at IGF-1, you have to understand that it doesn't tell the full story. I think realistically, if you're someone that is in the 100, 200, even 300 range nanograms per milliliter, um, that is going to put you in an advantageous position from a longevity standpoint. Now, GH is not a free ride. And there are certainly individuals who I have strongly encouraged, (laughs) do not use it. Um, If you're pushing into the 300s and you're prioritizing performance, not risk minimization, we also need to have a very thorough, very accurate history of whether or not you are at risk um, or the potentiation of risk of developing any kind of cancer. Because Although GH in itself, it will not cause cancer, it can be cancer promoting. So this is where having a very clear idea of your personal history, your family history, and if there is any kind of mass, any kind, whether it's benign, even if there's a suspicion, I would strongly recommend getting that sorted out before ever touching growth hormone or a growth hormone receptor agonist. So there is going to be a range in which we do have to be mindful of the potentiation of acromegaly. Now, for many of you, you're probably thinking, okay, well, if that is at all a risk, it's not something I want to take. We see in studies that the ranges for this would be closer to that 600, 700 nanogram per milliliter. So when we're looking at a dose that is focused on longevity, anti-aging, and specifically risk minimization, so in healthy individuals, this is going to be closer to that one, two, three, even four I use. But this is where it can be helpful to have those IGF-1 levels tested. But Here's the thing. IGF-1, it doesn't tell the whole story. You also need to look at IGF binding proteins. So if these are low, even moderate IGF-1 could mean excessive growth signaling. Now, in short, if you're running high doses or you're running it for a long time, these are ones that I would get tested. All right. Should you cycle GH or can you stay on year round? So for most athletes, the smarter play is to periodize. So at higher doses, if you're someone who is five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I use a day. If 
that is something that you've decided is warranted given the prep or the phase that you're in, um, it would be wise to drop to physiological dosing. Um, really what we need to take a closer look at is the metabolic fatigue, the insulin resistance, and water retention, because that can build up over time. And you kind of have to think of it like weight training. I mean, this isn't going to be something that um, offers the same kind of return in a way it can be compounding. And especially if there are other lifestyle factors or other drugs in play that are exacerbating insulin resistance, water retention, potentially leading to hypertension, this needs to be addressed. And it certainly, certainly can't be ignored. 